Okay, well, um, good afternoon and welcome to this seminar, which will be held in English, uh, because we have one of the panelists uh, from uh, Estonia. So, uh, to... Uh, Sorry, Finland. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Fresh in from Estonia, but uh, from and Finland. Estonia, both. <laughs> So sorry. Uh, my name is Jonas Klevhog, and I have a difficulty separating Finland from Estonia, <laughs> but I will nevertheless be moderating this session, uh, how to create secure and efficient public IT infrastructure. And to help me do that, I have this very prominent uh, panel, Patrick Ferström, uh, the technical director of NetNod, uh, and also well, one of the internet pioneers, uh, a living walking legend, we might say. Uh, here promoting uh, one of the recent uh, happenings in, in Swedish uh, digital care, we might say, uh, recent ones. We have uh, Björn Lundell, from, uh, the professor in data science from Skövde uh, Universitet, Skövde Högskola. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Universitet, Hex. not yet, Högskola. And last but not least, we have uh, Ville Sevier, uh, the CEO CEO of the Nordic Institute for Interoperability Solutions, the NIIS, and XROAD. Uh, but you're headquartered in Estonia. That's correct. Ah, yes. <laughs> thank you so much. So, um, just to uh, mention to all of you here, we are streaming this session. So, for those of you who don't want to be uh, uh, broadcasted without your consent, please uh, refrain from speaking or write your questions. Um, but uh, beware that it is streamed. So now you are uh, GDPR-ly uh, uh, noted, duly. So uh, we are um, here to, because we, um, well, we see uh, an increasing demand for digital services in, in society and, uh, and an increasing amount, hence. Uh, at the same time, we then hear uh, an increasing uh, amount of stories about security breakdowns and, and, uh, um, and, uh, and crashes uh, on these systems. So uh, despite large sums being spent on them, uh, they seem to be uh, difficult to trust. Or are they? So how do we actually uh, go about to, to ensure the future of, of, uh, of the quality and, and efficiency of these digital infrastructure? Uh, and, um, well, we, we have the Swedish Transport Agency as a recent uh, story. We have the uh, Swedish uh, Healthcare Guide or the Digital he Healthcare Guide 1177 as two examples, uh, recent ones. So um, in the previous session, uh, since I'm not uh, an expert on these things, especially not the technical level, could we just do a, a hand, show of hands to just to know the, the level in the room here? What, what, what level of no knowledge do we have here? How many are developing services for, for internet, working with developing services. Oh, quite a few, okay. How many are uh, trying to influence policy on, on internet? Politicians mainly, or yeah, okay, <laughs> lobbyists, okay. And how many are just, uh, how many are using the internet? <laughs> <laughs> That's the baseline, basically, okay, good. Um, how, many, how many feel more comfortable writing jokes in code? than in your native language. <laughs> Excellent. We have, so we range from, from uh, very techy to uh, just regular internet users. I, in the previous session, I introduced a metaphor uh, when I got into the subject or the topic of uh, regulating the, the platforms, uh, which was the playground. When I got into the subject, I, I, it reminded me of, of the playground. In the, in the beginning, the playground was open, and you could do quite a lot of fun stuff just with a pail and shovel. Uh, but as time went by, uh, people uh, invented uh, new fun things like swings and uh, climbing frames and, and uh, slides and stuff like that. So more people came to join and had more fun on the playground. Uh, and, and these days, th there have sort of been, uh, these, these structures have turned into uh, layers, layers of playgrounds or structures and, and um, uh, climbing frames and swings. So it's quite difficult to, to get anything done with a shovel and pail this, these days. But nevertheless, it's, it gets easier to, do, to, to create new fun services. But on the other hand, it gets more difficult, I suppose, when you realize that the foundation that your service is built on uh, makes your service crash. So when you need to do alterations to the foundation. Uh, is that a fair metaphor for what we're talking about here? 
I, I think so. So what you're describing is that we have this layers of layers of different kind of sort of services or building blocks for that we're using. And uh, in each layer, you probably provide something to the layer above and you sort of need or require something from the layer below. Mm. And that kind of relationship up and down is something that each layer in the value chain have. Mm. So, so I think, uh, so, so in the general, general terms, yes, I think, I think you're right. And the difficulty here is to focus on what you really are doing. What you are really doing in terms exactly, of exactly because what, what do you well want to the, the problem today is that there are three main reasons for for services of any kind specifically lower down the value chain why they are why they don't work one the lack of electricity power outages the second one that something physically break and the third one is misconfiguration mm -hmm. and if you can remove those three then you're probably like taking care of like 95% of the problems that you have, okay? Okay. So, so the first thing is that we need to focus on, if we look at sort of the ability for things to work, we need to sort of focus on these kind of basic things, um, which, which is not so, so, so easy actually, if you think about how to upgrade a server or, or upgrade a database or reconfigure it. Um, <laughs> and you have to take into account that one third of the errors is just because you actually mistype something, okay? Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, <laughs> so be How good be be because what is important is that to start with, you need to ensure that you can communicate and that the servers work, okay? Secondly, you need to ensure that the right person or the right party can mm. access the right information at the right point in time. Mm. And the third one is the more traditional security issues regarding sort of encryption and other kind of stuff. So as, if it is the case that things are not up and running or down, which is like one of the issues, then you, of course, you, you will not try, you will, you will the, the amount of trust that you have in the service or in your layer in the value chain will, will decrease. So it's not that the, the layers of structures are wrongly uh, constructed, it's more like they, uh, they are uh, exposed to power outages and, and physical breakdowns and, and then uh, miscompensation. Well, the, the, the problem there is that in each layer, the easiest way for you, for example, if you require something from a layer below, regardless of what layer you're in, the best thing is if you can choose between multiple providers and mm. you choose whatever, whichever, whatever one you think is the best. The problem today is that both if you go down or up the value chain, the amount of providers that you can choose between decreases. And that is one of the problems now. And, and, and unfortunately, market uh -huh. economy forces, market economy is leading to fewer players because you're only interested in being able to have a low barrier of entry for new players as long as you are not the, the dominant one. As soon as you are the dominant one, then you don't want any competition, which means that you don't want any alternatives and you try to lock in whoever you are providing a service for. You should have been here for the previous session, actually. We're talking about the platforms, the giants and, and their responsibility. But the, but, the, but, the, no, but the important thing is that I talk about this as a generic concept, yes. regardless of where you are in the value chain, ah, yeah. because I think it's, it's wrong to think about it as the giants. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Bjorn, what do you say? Is it a fair metaphor uh, to, to describe the problem as the uh, Yeah, I, I very much agree with what Potty is saying here. Yeah. Uh, there are different lev levels, and, and our research is focused a little bit higher up in this chain. So, mm. so in addition to those issues, there are also issues to do with lack of interoperability caused by different implementers implementing the same specification in mm. different ways, mm -hmm. which means that you inhibit the interoperability. Mm -hmm. And that can be caused by intentional creating a software which shouldn't work, instead of trying to solve a problem in order to, 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 to create your and strengthen your market position. So, so our research has very much focused on the interoperability issue and also different aspects of lock-in as part of that because so there are there there are sort of not only technical issues there are also ipr issues to do with specifications which can inhibit implementation for example so you're basically talking about intentional uninteroperability yeah okay uh, as as one of the problems here yeah absolutely fantastic uh, Wille, what, how, do you, how would you frame or describe yeah. the, the, the issue at hand? Yeah, I was what are think, the thinking, and I can, I can share quite much of these expressed opinions on, on the issue, so that we have uh, different categories of questions, which are partly on the infrastructure and which are partly on the operational side, and then we have issues which are more related in the development of services, and in the end, the citizen services. And maybe we can also think it so that we can have an approach when we are building a fundament for 
national infrastructure. We can make lots of studies on that and we can prepare large plans how we implement infrastructure. The other way looking into it is to take the citizen-centered approach so that we think what are the citizen services and what, are, what is actually needed to operate those. So we can approach the same question from two different ways. But if we try to solve all the different layers and dimensions of interoperability, in example, that's leading to a situation when we only make reports in the end. So my take is that mm. we should actually work on the citizen center side, thinking about what is needed to make the systems more interoperable mm. and to make mm. some good in saving money and implementing once only principle in example and so on. It's many examples what it can actually help. So are you arguing then that it is not a problem that should be solved by uh, a giant uh, major solution or, or a big unified solution, but rather start eating the elephant uh, one piece at a time? Yeah, this is kind of eating the elephant question because I see it every day when working with our development teams when we talk about some features or things we want to implement and if I ask for how much time and money you need they can save me 100,000 or 1 million or 10 million hmm. depending on how large elephant we want to build. Hmm. So it's that kind of question we can work on the infrastructure from day to day and we can look it as a whole and finally it's very difficult to get small steps forward. Okay. That's how I look into it. It's all important too. So, um, so as we so we seem to have have a, a fairly good idea of what the problem is and, and the challenges yeah. ahead. Uh, and as we now move into listening to to some of the solutions or suggested solutions, uh, I would encourage you to to actually uh, ask questions as we as we go. And we have a, can, a can I maybe add there? Yeah, there sure. is also a competence issue. I mean, many organizations that that want to procure stuff, they don't have a clue about what they want. Yeah. And they write requirements in such a way so that they actually <coughs> unintentionally lock mm. themselves in mm. without really wanting that. Mm. So, so you create problems in that end as well. Mm. And it's also the case that at the point, at the current point in time, like um, at the Royal Academy of Engineering Sciences, where I'm very, very active. Um, what we found in a study that we actually are uh, presenting tomorrow is that the current quality of internet access or what people normally in broadband is not of the level that the society requires. So we should not mix up how we are doing things, how we should do things with the current situation, which mm -hmm. unfortunately is pretty crappy. Mm -hmm. so, so digging ourselves out of the hole in the ground where we're standing at the moment is something different from how we should design things. The next thing I would like to mention, just because you mentioned transport studios and, and, and the health services, is that not only from a legal point of view, but also from a design point of view, there is a very, very big difference between normal information security or cyber security, mm. where you do a risk balanced sort of risk calculation on the various design mm. measures you do, and the, uh, and the protective security secrets uh, with, which, which only talk about the consequences. So, so when we talk about the second squid, which a lot of these kind of things with the new legislation that we have since 1st of April, that is only consequence-based design of whatever kind of protection you have normally against an antagonist uh, part of, which is a subset. So that's also something that we should not sort of mix up the two. You also mentioned when we uh, discussed this previously, uh, there is perhaps an overarching question in, in the vertical versus the horizontal uh, should it be vertical pipes or should it be or are, do we have uh, horizontal layers uh, here uh, absolutely and um, and and i think everyone today agree that it is a vertical uh, separated layers mm -hmm. uh, the uh, the time when we did pipes it, it is gone that said just because of the the the, the crappy quality and the and, and, and the lack of competition for regarding various pieces, various of the roles of the infrastructure. Uh, of course, there are various parties that think we should still build pipes for, for emergency services, for security, look at the mm. like, various different kind of services that we are, as a society, also spending quite a lot of money on. And, um, and that is pretty difficult to untangle those discussions just because of the situation today. So, so just to be clear, so not mm. to be confused, because I think there was a bit of a mix-up with vertical and pipes and, and horizontal and layers. Yes. Horizontal, horizontal you're saying Horizontal is layers yeah. that we in, in EVA call a lasagna. Yeah. There's actually a lawyer at a different agency. That and, you're, the, and, and you're pipes, arguing, yes. I'm arguing that, or what we in EVA says, it is a fact that we have horizontal layering. Exactly. It is nothing to discuss. Mm. Stop discussing it. Mm. Okay. That said, you might have the same organizational entity providing multiple roles in multiple layers but just because one party is actually acting in multiple layers mm -hmm. that doesn't mean that we suddenly have a pipe 
we might get a pipe because of lack of interoperability intentionally than like Bjorn is right. talking about. So the market, really market economy will uh, continue to, to, uh, to build pipes yes. Uh, yes. And, and fight the, the, the lasagna. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> That's a fight to take, fight the lasagna. It, it is, yes. <laughs> okay. Uh, did we have a question here? Not yet. I thought I saw someone wave. Okay. Um, so please feel free to, to just enter the, uh, the, the discussion. Um, I, I asked you to, or you have been asked by, by, by uh, Katarina actually, to present <laughs> your, uh, your work, what you're doing in five minutes or so. So yeah. I would like you to basically start, uh, Patrick, to, to just uh, describe what, what are you doing at NetNod and, and uh, what are the work that you are, solutions in this aspect, of course, that yeah. you so uh, uh, would like to... Um, Put forward. So NetNode is an incorporated owned by a foundation and we are now a little bit more than 20 years old and uh, we provide wholesale services for, uh, just like we were, <laughs> I just explained, we provide wholesale sales services for people that want to build robust infrastructure. Uh, we do three things. We provide IX and transport services for people that move IP packets. So we are way down the value chain. So ISPs and others like everyone, including Google and whoever are customer of ours. The second thing we do is that we provide um, DNS services for anyone that would like to have proper DNS, but don't come to us. We are wholesale. Go to one of our resellers and, and you will get the best DNS infrastructure there is. So we provide one of the root servers and DNS for 30 countries in the world, etc. Mm -hmm. And the third thing we do is that we are responsible for distribution of time and frequency. So everyone that needs frequency and, and time in Sweden, they, they get that from us. So that's what we're doing. So, so very, very boring plumbing service, whatever. And how, how do you see this uh, work in, this, in the direction of more efficient and, and secure uh, well, IT infrastructure, of, public of, infrastructure? Of, of being, the, being responsible for sort of the technical, the, the direction where we go, not no technical, of course, I think we do the right thing. Yes. <laughs> Otherwise, I would do something different. Um, now, a joke aside, um, I, I think... I think it's important that people try to focus on exactly the services that they, they are the best uh, on doing. Uh, for example, for our day-to-day -day email, uh, we found that we are not the best one running email ourselves, so we have outsourced that ourselves. Uh, okay. So um, just and, as one example. And uh, then what, what twist or USP would you uh, like to add to NetNodes uh, doing well, what you the, do best? That, 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 for example, the, these very, 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 very few specific things. So for example, if we look at uh, the, the, uh, the transport service that we have, is that it is cheaper and more efficient for ISPs and others to buy transport service from us than to rent dark fiber and try to build a network together because, because we have 100% uptime since 2002 of our transport services. So instead of having sort of having the service break, you can sort of buy it from someone else. So, so the argument is then that what you do, uh, you do uh, so good that you actually can document the, the uptime and stability and security oh, of absolutely. it. Oh, uh, absolutely! Just like, just in, like a, in a different yeah, yeah, yeah. just like level. we are, just like we at Netno, we don't dig down fiber. Other people are much better in fiber than us. Yeah. So we're just doing one very, very thin layer there, and that's that's also if you compare, for example, Gothenburg, Stockholm, and Malmo, and, and if you look at the large uh, the, the log cities in Sweden, mm -hmm. we see that it's much, much easier and better to provide IT services as a start a company in Stockholm than in Gothenburg. So you say if if everyone uh, in the I, IT infrastructure business would stick to what they did best. Uh, we would uh, stick come a long way. Stick where they are, what they're doing the best, uh, be a good procurer and mm -hmm. look at the interoperability to ensure that you have multiple oh, players to okay. choose from. So okay. whenever you are, so as a procurer, for example, public sector is really important that they are a good procurer and, and actually require, for example, a well and good working internet access. So interoperability is then... Uh, it's key, otherwise you get a lock-in situation and you only buy from one party and then you're doomed. Then you then you then just look at for example everything from this preloaded cards for transport tickets. Mm. I live down in Skåne, work in Stockholm. How come I cannot use the same card? It's yeah. just completely silly. Yes, okay. yes, indeed. indeed it is. Yes, I, oh, don't get me started on, on uh, so, transport so payment like, but systems. Why, why do we accept? Why do we as citizens of Sweden accept that? In the Northern Czech Republic, you pay with your visa card everywhere you go, and you, you get charged uh, in hindsight, in retrospect. So it, it, you don't even have to bet on if you want a day card or single tickets. 
isn't that good? Uh, but I'm, yeah, don't get me started on transport <laughs> payments. Uh, so, interoperability. So any, no, we're, we're, yeah, we're, we're, you're handing over to Björn quite nicely, but do we have any questions for Patrick on, on what NetNot do, or are you completely familiar with? Who's with your main competitor in Sweden? Uh, for time and frequency, we don't really have any. <laughs> the, or, or the, the competitor are people that use GPS receivers to get time and frequency, which we know is not working really well. Because of Pokemon Go, we have a lot of replay attacks on, and on GPS. So you cannot trust. So first of all, you cannot trust on GPS. So if you have a service that is important for the society, if you use GPS, well, not so good. Um, for IX, there are other uh, exchange, um, uh, the, the internet exchanges in Sweden. Uh, there are, for example, uh, STH, IX and others. But on the other hand, the difference is that we have 24-hour staff. They are one person, one and a half person. So, so it depends on what you're buying for. Just like when you buy milk or whatever, you can choose what you're buying. And on, on DNS, there are, there are multiple players. But on the other end of CN Sweden, which we actually just sounded really a little bit nervous about, is that more and more players that you can buy DNS from as an organization, they stop run DNS themselves and buy from us. So if you choose from one player to another, it might be the case that you still have us as a backend. So if you want to get rid of us, it might be hard. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Uh, yes, another question. Uh, and, uh, what, what do you think of the increased uh, autonomy of internet in a city area? Or, uh, well, like if Stockholm was cut off from the rest of the world, it would still kind of work. Today, it would really not because of there's so much services outside. But, but do, you, do you think there's, there's a need for increased autonomy within also regions and cities? Uh, that we should have uh, resilience and, and, and redundance also on a local level. Sorry, I need to repeat the question for the stream. Well. <laughs> so the question was, uh, so, is the... So smaller functioning... We, we need to repeat it so yeah. that the people streaming yeah. can hear it. Yeah. So you're asking, uh, do, do we need a, a more resilient local or regional level for IT infrastructure uh, that, that is autonomous? Is that the question? Yeah, less okay. dependent on, on international services. Less dependent on international services. Patrick. Okay, so first of all, uh, the ISPs in Sweden, we are found in, in work that research that we have done the, we cannot handle a situation where the control plane of the ISPs got partitioned, get, get split up, which means that we cannot build autonomous, uh, autonomous sort of islands of, of Sweden, full stop. Okay? That, that's a surprise, and, and people that try to build the internet in Sweden and stuff, they, or specifically regulators, they don't, don't really know this. Uh, so that is something. So what we have to do is to ensure that, that for example, <coughs> Stockholm and Visby and, and, and Malmö and whatever and Sveg, that they don't get di disconnected from each other. We must have robustness because we cannot isolate various islands. So to answer your question, that would be nice <laughs> to be able to do, but no, it, it is not. We need instead, we need to build more robust networks. Björn, yeah. the Högskola, you have done research on interoperability, on open standards, and, and what, is your, yeah. um, what, is, what, is, what do you bring to the table uh, yeah. or the discussion when, yes. uh, when it comes to uh, the future of, of efficient and secure IT infrastructure? Mm -hmm. We have done research for a couple of decades on basically three challenges. I mean, interoperability is one aspect where we have looked specifically at software implementations of standards of various forms, both for uh, sort of interoperability that we have talked about here for communication and such, but also for data standards. We have perhaps been more focused on that side, looking at uh, representation of data. We have looked at uh, lock-in, uh, not only lock-in to vendors, lock-in to technologies, but also lock-in to, to standards, which, which could be problematic to implement for various reasons. Mm. Uh, there, there are a number of problems that you can find with various types of standards. Uh, we have looked at uh, legal aspects of contracts, etc., where you make yourself dependent upon a certain uh, provider of a service, where the service can change over time, and, and, and there could be all sorts of different uh, aspects. Uh, we, we actually have a legal, I'm not a legal person myself, but we have a legal expert in our group, actually. So it's quite broad. And the third challenge that we are looking into that we haven't discussed so far is the longevity of systems. So if you work with aviation industry, for example, you have typically 70 years for a system, 
which means that the soft... an airplane. Or yeah, for example, yeah. an Airbus A340, for example, mm -hmm. has 78 years of life cycle, which means that if you design something with a proprietary license software, you can be sure that the software isn't there over the full life cycle, which means, means that the design assets, etc., and the data and the representation, etc., needs to mm -hmm. be maintained over time. And that is exactly the same as you have in the public sector if you want to preserve important data, mm -hmm. important for democracy, etc. That you want to go back to see transparency and what, what was discussed, etc. 50 years ago, etc. And, and it's not always the case that you, you can access your own information over very long life cycles. And what have you found uh, as conclusions uh, in, in this research? That well, we, we, have, we have found, uh, we have specifically looked into use of standards which are perhaps uh, problematic in the sense that there are no good implementations of them that are sustainable. So, so we are specifically looking into use of standards for which there are sustainable open source implementations. So we are looking into that specific relationship and uh, looking into procurement where you refer to standards for which there is no open source implementation, which causes risks because over time, if that software is no longer available and if there can't be a new software, for example, because the specification isn't complete, so you can't really implement it, even if you have all the money in the world, it becomes a black box and, and you can really run into problems. Mm -hmm. so, so it's both economically, technically and legally, so to say. Yeah. So, but, but you, are, you, are you saying the conclusion is that procurement uh, of these systems needs, needs to actually uh, require open standards uh, some, yes. in all, la all yes. la layers? And that all is levels. a requirement if you do public sector procurement today in Sweden in a governmental agency. But the, the problem is that the practice isn't, isn't there today. Okay, so, it's so, so, so the reality is one thing and, and what should be the reality is something else. Ah. Hmm. So, so, so we look at this not only from a procurement point of view, but we also try to understand how soft, complex software development projects uh, evolve over time and how they are organized and controlled as such. So we work with hmm. a number of industrial players in different sectors to, to help them to, to improve practice as part of this. And you've been doing this research uh, for S 20 since, years? Yeah, more, yeah. more since the 90s. So, so uh, do you see, is this going in the right direction? Is, is there hope or is it going... Uh, to some extent it goes in the right direction, to some extent it goes in the wrong direction, I would say. Uh -huh. so, so we see more and more complex lock-in today. What good examples would you say that, that you see then? Uh, I mean, I mean, good examples, I mean, if, if you talk about the infrastructure level that, where Partick is more focused, I mean, at the lower level, the internet standards like the IETF standards and the web standards, there you have a good practice and mm -hmm. a different way of building standards. Mm -hmm. Whereas in, in many other areas, there are more problems to do with the, the traditional way. Upper levels and the more commercial well, ones? different ways by which you build the standards. So, so like the, there are many ISO standards, for example, which are problematic from that point of view. Okay, so, so it's, not, it's not directly linked to the layers and the pipes? Not necessarily, but, but many of the good examples are at the lower level, I would say. Okay, yeah. But, but there are still examples, for example, if we take from the IETF, uh, if you take the things like, for example, some of the crypto uh, mechanisms, you have some of the large vendors, they are following the standard, but they are using a proprietary crypto mechanism mm -hmm. for, the, for the key exchange or the initial key, key negotiation phase, which means that, which is not documented anywhere, which means that you cannot in reality not really get interoperability because you cannot authenticate. So you're sort of acting on an open uh, standard or yes. protocol, but you're uh, applying proprietary uh, yeah. algorithms which yeah. or keys or, that... or something that is very close. For example, if you, do, you look at the, uh, for, e uh, for email, the IMAP protocol, where Google has implemented the IMAP protocol, but in reality, the folder concept mm -hmm. in the IMAP protocol is really a flag on the email. So, so which means that when you're looking at the view, a list the number of fold, number of email <coughs> in a folder according to the protocol, mm -hmm. according to Google, that instead is a search for all email messages which have a separate flag. That kind of small distinction requires clients to actually be able to handle the Google folder concept different than what it was intentionally. How, how does this then, uh, this kind of uh, mix up actually affect stability or efficiency and security of, of the system, of the infrastructure? 
I, I mean, it can end up in a situation where you cannot access your own data. And yeah. we have seen that in many cases. Mm -hmm. I mean, we are looking into large corpus of data, etc. Mm. And, and information is lost, lost in, in sort of practical terms mm. because you have no good means for, for really accessing your, your own information. And the more people go to the cloud, the risk increases from that perspective because you, you, you put in stuff in, in the solution, in the service, and you get it out perhaps in, in, in something which is similar, but you don't know because you have no guarantees for that the transforms are there. So, so, so the way by which you migrate from format X to format Y, you can compare it with take a text in Swedish, put it into an automatic translation to French, translate that to German and back to Swedish. You are not typically in the same text no. again. And, no, and, it's and quite fun actually, if you've tried it. Yeah. Uh, if you haven't tried it, please do. It, it's quite a yeah. fun, fun exercise. And that's what, what can happen in, mm. in these services okay. when, when you have that over time. Thank you. Any questions to Björn on, on the research that uh, you've been doing? Clarification questions? We I move. Have one yes. Question mm -hmm. for you that, do you see something very disruptive that could take place that will change this game? I think perhaps uh, from quantum computing and things like that, they start to hear. New technology. Do you see new technology that, that can uh, disrupt, can disrupt this development? For, for the way we are building I, we might get back to that question, yeah, uh, but okay. so give a, please give yeah. a, a quick answer here. But we, I uh, see a need for a lot of Lego pieces of really good sustainable components, open source implementation of commonly used formats, which will ease or in, at least uh, reduce the risk for lack of interoperability. It is a risk to use a format for which there is no good open source implementation. And that could be a Lego piece that everyone can use. To some extent, actually, I think Wille has a, uh, one answer to the question uh, that we just got here. If there is new technology uh, emerging, and, and um, so XROAD is, is a platform or ecosystem um, which has been uh, developed in, by Estonia and Finland in, in collaboration. Could you tell us a bit more yeah. about this infrastructure, and what, what it does and why it was developed? Yeah, actually, I think answering these kind of questions, it's good to tell the story of XROAD. So I don't know how many of you know XROAD or have heard about XROAD quite <coughs> often. Yeah. So in the end of 1990s, Estonia had to find a solution for organizing data exchange between different information systems. And at that time, they established the project, which is nowadays known as XROAD, which is the name of the software created after that. So XROAD is a data exchange layer solution, which is connecting different information systems. Uh, it works like an environment, and each organization uh, joining it will establish its own access point, which is called a security server, technically. So that is the main idea of XROAD, to have a national environment for data exchange, which is secure, which is way of standardized. It doesn't have any official standards, so it's an interesting thing as we talk about standards. And we see no need for standardizing it currently because it would only limit the way how we develop it. But yes, the story about XROAD is also interesting because Finland joined the cooperation in 2014, 15, between that. And since 2015, Estonia and Finland have been developing XROAD together. And uh, it was only in 2017 when Nordic Institute for Interoperability Solutions was established. And in 2018, we took over the development of XROAD. And when we talk about the vendor lockings and that kind of things, um, XROAD is free, it's open source. All development is open, so or Jira, Confluence, everything is open for anyone. So it's free for anyone to go and have a look what we are doing in the next spring solve. So all open. And that is one way of managing such public administration solution so that we make it fully open. There are no security risks, basically, because if there would be something that we should hide, it would not be very easily done when we publish it as open source. So, so I must say that it brings us additional security to work on open source and to get lots of developer feedback and comments. So that kind of development models can also be a very good answer for the need of, of uh, avoiding any kind of locking situations. Uh, when it's fully open, we can always change the vendors. We make a public procurement for a three-year period, usually. Now we have the first such ongoing, and we also make some additional programs for the resources. And uh, we are a non-profit association, so our members are Estonia and Finland. The countries are paying a membership fee, and then we purchase, uh, purchase development services for them. 
So that is the operating model. And I would say that that kind of approach might also work very well for Sweden. And we are, of course, welcoming Sweden very much to join the Doric Institute <laughs> for Interoperability Solutions. That's what we really look forward. So who, who in Sweden would then be the... the, the I, I can tell you know that. I mean, DIG, DIG has looked into it, mm -hmm. the, the yeah. Enheten for... We have had very good yeah. cooperation yeah. with yeah. different agencies yeah. here. Yes. Yeah. The Authority for Digitalization. Yeah. 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 Has looked into it. Yeah. 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 And, and they would be the, the customer for, for uh, or the, the well, uh, Swedish counterpart? It, it depends. Well, usually when we talk about the counterparts, like with Estonia and Finland, we have, um, we have the ministries who are the responsible ones for mm. joining these. So it's a national decision on joining it. Mm. And then we have the technical uh, operators. So it can be something like DIG in Sweden, which is operating the national environment. And we have different groups, like we have a technical working group, we have an advisory group talking about how we develop XROAD and how we develop NIS as an organization. And then finally we have our general meeting in which the ministries have the word and they decide what we finally do. Mm. So it's all decided by our members every year, how they want to set the membership fee level and what they want to do. And they also will decide if they will bring in new components under development in NIS. So now we only work on XROAD, but it might be some other technologies as well in the future. It's very right. effective to, cha to share all the costs of development, of course. Do, so, uh, Björn, you, you are a bit yeah. familiar with, with XROAD, and uh, what is your yeah, comment, that, that reflection to what you just uh, stated yeah. in your research? I, I think that what, what Bill is describing is one way by which you can organize the organization around building these Lego pieces that I talked mm -hmm. about. So it's one approach by which you can, can, can do certain things, and I think that Building standards through an implementation is one way. I mean, you build an implementation first and, and thereafter you can document it and thereafter you can take it to a formal recognition as mm -hmm. a standard. That is one way of, of building standards as well. Do you see it uh, serving the need to start eating the elephant at one, uh, one piece at a time? Or do you see it as a, uh, you said one way, so is it a, is it a way which is... Um, but, uh, what I mean is that not, it is not necessarily the case that the way by which NIS has organized around building this particular uh, system would fit every different type of standard or specification. Mm -hmm. so, so I think that there could be different models of doing that. Mm -hmm. and, and even standardization organizations can have implementations as part of building the standard. I mean, ETSI is currently experimenting, for example, and it has been common practice in IETF and W3C for quite some time to do that. Okay. I would say that when we have been talking about the Swedish lasagna model, uh, I've heard this lasagna thing many times in Twitter, and, <laughs> and I would describe X-Road as the worst, best bechamel sauce in that lasagna. <laughs> so we have, it's one layer and it melts very nicely from end to end. So, so the idea is that it's not for everything, but it's really one of the few available tools for interconnecting uh, yeah. public information systems. If you look into different solutions which are available in the market, even commercial ones, you don't find quite many actually, which would be built from ground up for that purpose only. So that's what makes it quite specific. And as Bjorn said, it is true, it's kind of de facto standard how it is mm -hmm. getting more and more a standard. Mm -hmm. uh, I was recently in Brussels participating in a European Union workshop on e-delivery related issues and we had a, a full meeting room of people telling about different initiatives and things they are starting in each country for data interoperability and it was a bit confusing to say that we have a solution which has been in production since 2001 and it's free for anyone and no one is using it now so <laughs> we are just asking what is wrong like uh, every country seems to be building its own solutions again and again and what we also want to see is, is to have this kind of standard, as you say, like um, there has to be certain standards in place and XROAD is implementing nationally kind of standardized way of connecting the different information systems. It brings more information security in that sense. If you have, let's say, 2000 different information systems and you build point to point integrations, it's quite a risky business and I don't know who has the capability <coughs> of keeping track on the quality and the work of all these integrations, but maybe someone does. So, Patrick, sure. Yes, we, we, so we talk about different ways of actually enabling this interoperability and, yeah. and we are using a completely different model. Uh, we are looking very strictly at the various standards which specify the order of the bits on the wire mm -hmm. between the parties that communicate, which is not even the APIs, it's actually the protocol on the wire. And then we are very, very 
uh, as NetNull, we are very strict on actually implementing those protocols mm -hmm. and be conforming to them and also developing new ones, for example, for, for, uh, for network time distribution, the secure network time that we're currently doing. So, so for us, no, we are not having open source for our, our production service or, or, or um, provisioning system that's part of our secret source. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, we provide just 100% uh, interoperability, which means that there was a question about our competitors. We compete by providing exactly the same service, much better than others. Mm -hmm. But if we, if we one day don't provide the service good enough, then our customers will move somewhere else. So, so we are bound by market economy to make sure that we provide services for the right price, because mm -hmm. it is, if you buy the, like, it's like going and getting meatballs and lingon silt and mashed potatoes, whatever. Mm -hmm. It's the same thing wherever you go. Really, really boring. Okay. So, so the other way is not to open source, but, like, but for time and frequency, where we are the only one that deliver things, uh, we do things exactly the same way with open source. So if anyone would like to build a multi 40 gig NTP server in FPGA with your own hardware, you can just download the software and like, good luck. Um, and no, seriously, we really don't mind having anyone actually find that. <coughs> And uh, we still, we so far only have one other person that tried to get the NTP server together. So, so, so anyway, so, so sort of, so we have these two models. Yeah. So are you saying that, yeah, okay, so the two models, and so your uh, x is bad news for, for NetNode? No, no, not at all. Not at all. We have no. different, there are two different ways of, of doing different things. And, uh, and, and we have chosen to uh, keep our things more close, but on the other hand, we are really, really working hard and pushing for interoperability to enable competitors to be able to stay in the market. Mm. Because the day when, because we are owned by a foundation, if we did the slightest thing to keep competitors out in that case, mm -hmm. that would not be accepted by our owners. Yeah. So, uh, so how can, so if, if uh, interoperability seems to be the, the, the way forward or the, the yeah. magic bullet here. So I, th I think instead of using the, inter the word interoperability, a word that I use sometimes, which sometimes is easier, is replaceable. So whenever you are in a, on, on, the, on the layer in the value chain and you buy a service from someone below, you should be able to replace that provider or that service with something else. Yep. If you cannot do that, then you don't have interoperability right. in however you are using the service below. Replaceable. Yeah. Yeah. So turning. So so making systems or IT infrastructure yeah. uh, a good foundation yeah. for replaceable services. Yeah. Uh, is is the, uh, the and of course it could be replaceable over time, like we're here with the, yeah. with Xroad that you buy. You you you, mm. you need to enable the seven to eight year lifespan or whatever you are providing, mm. and you might buy Xroad and you write a contract with three years mm. because of course it's not just flipping a switch to swap yes. from one thing to another one. Mm. You might have to take the source code, understand how it works, and implement it yourself. Yeah. Yeah. But you still need to have a plan on how you are and know, and this is normal risk management for whatever you are providing. Hmm. Have a plan for how you replace and whatever you're buying, and not many people do that. Sure. We have a question here. I just like to hear Willy talk about the Islam and now Finland's project, because you're also talking about the organization of interoperability mm -hmm. and even the political interoperability. Mm -hmm. And those two questions we hardly not discuss in Sweden. So you would like we, to... We hear are <coughs> on the technical, we are in the forefront. I would say we are starting to see unrepresented <coughs> healthcare. So we have a big problem with the semantic interoperability. Mm -hmm. And when it's come to organizational, it's because of our county councils. So we have the right to make our own decision. Mm. So what, what is your question to Villa? I was just admiring. <laughs> <laughs> so... <laughs> so uh, the question here from the audience was uh, around the organizational, the political yeah. uh, interoperability, but also the semantical yeah. sorry? Necessary components. components and d dimensions of the interoperability yeah. discussion. Yeah. Mm. Well, what, what we can see happening in the Europe is that uh, the EU is all the time leading more and more uh, everything what is happening in data exchange and interoperability. I have seen that it has been a, maybe a bit passive actor from someone's point of view in the recent years, but, but now I see very positive development in that it's more and more discussion between the countries how we develop such solutions that we can guarantee interoperability between the EU countries. But I see it divided into two different groups. The first is about uh, sector-specific interoperability, like we talk about e-health, DSI and that kind of things. So it is really very sector specific for very good reasons, like you mentioned, semantic interoperability and some sector specific needs. 
But when we talk about general interoperability of quite ordinary information systems, which do not have such much maybe of these problems, like when we talk about in Finland and Estonia about population register, business register, and tax boards registers, uh, those are areas in which we can easily implement such solution like XROAD. And the reason why we also do it is that XROAD has a built-in functionality called Trust Federation, which allows to interconnect two different XROAD environments. So Estonia and Finland have already established cross-border data exchange between each others. And this is the reason when you talk about the political level and why I want to pick it up. Mm. It's also a political question. Do we want to exchange data easily with our neighboring countries? When we have a national mm. environment implemented on a similar technology, it is much quicker and more efficient to implement new uh, data exchange connections between the information systems. We had a question here. So yes. Yeah. Um, all of you have at one point or another during the panel mentioned the topic of public procurement. Yes. Um, a friend of mine, I don't remember exactly which one of them, once mentioned <laughs> to me that there's, there's a study about the Swedish public sector specifically uh, that shows that the Swedish public sector, more than perhaps any other in, I don't know if it was Europe as a whole or the Nordic countries, but anyway, is dependent on Microsoft code, Microsoft software. Um, Could be some of our research showing that. Uh, per perfectly possible. Mm -hmm. uh, so the question. Yeah, the question is, mm -hmm. what, what's, what's your comment on, on Ah. on uh, that situation, not, not specifically that it's Microsoft, but that we have one dominant actor. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the question is, what's the, the mm -hmm. comment on the fact that Sweden, <coughs> according to some research, uh, is supposedly more reliant on Microsoft, or at least one provider of services uh, than, than others? What, uh, Potter? First of all, that the, uh, whoever is ultimately responsible for the service that is provided, which is the, the, the head or director of an agency or, or whatever, like the one that is general director, okay, on that level, they are not taking the responsibility secure, uh, they don't take it seriously enough. So they delegate to the IT department to sort of just buy something, okay? So which means that there's not enough resources and they're not thinking about, which we heard about <coughs> in the previous panel, that digitalization is actually changing the way you do whatever you've done before, not applying an, a digital thing in your, in, your service, in, in your service. The second thing that is happening is that the IT department, whoever got that task, they are not thinking about being able to replace, like what happens at the end of this contract, which means that you don't have that kind of requirement and the rest is history. Now, there is one place where things have done, been done in a, prop, in a different way, and that is the Swedish tax authorities. I just want to spend mm -hmm. 30 seconds on why I think that is good. The Swedish tax authorities, as we all know, we can do our taxes with SMS messages in Sweden, whatever it is, and like, how come? Okay, so the story is that originally they had like now about 15 or 20, even more, 25 years ago, you, everyone in Sweden sent in the taxes on paper and you had hired people that typed in everything on paper, okay? All of those people ended up being retired and he tried to, the, the head of the tax authorities tried to hire new staff. No one applied. And he felt, if I cannot, if I cannot hire people, I will not be able to ensure that my agency is doing whatever I'm required to do. How do I do this? Well, I have to ask the citizens of Sweden to enter the data in my computers themselves. To be able to do that, we need everything from the computer systems, but also simply tax rules, privacy rules, mm -hmm. and the whole nine yards. And he started an enormous project mm -hmm. to make that change. Simply tax forms, simply tax rules, simply everything, not only. The, so that is a typical example mm -hmm. where the digitalization did not end up being a task for the IT department. And that I miss from so many other agencies in Sweden. But other um, people should have done it as well. So what you're talking about here is uh, perhaps a comment to uh, Microsoft dependency, but it, the, the example you bring up is basically one that has uh, been driven by a, a, a real challenge or Abs a quantified and framed challenge. If you look at any of, the, any of the big players that need storage, for example, there are many of the players that you buy storage both from Microsoft and from Amazon and from Google at the moment, and they are moving their virtual host or whatever they are doing, compute platforms between all of these three players. 
So it's not the case that Microsoft is not delivering sort of neutral things. It's more has to do with the IT department not getting enough funding, very, very limited scope, and they buy just exactly that without thinking about how to make sure that the system actually uh, survives a longer period of time. So they don't take it seriously. Yeah, I, I mean, it's important to stress that it's not the fault of the suppliers, it's those that require it as well. And, and, and we talk about exit uh, with the system. Can you take your data and take it further? And, and, and that is an important yep. uh, aspect. Any more questions? Yes. I got a question on, on the e-delivery that you were mentioning before. Mm -hmm. It's been around for about 10 years and, and, and it's built on old standards and we're moving into new standards with hyperledger projects and so on. How do you see that switch happening within this time of Finland and preferably even the Nordics? How do, you see, no. how do you see the switch on e-delivery happening in Estonia and mm. Finland? Uh, and, and the Nordics. Uh, and the Nordics. In regards to distributed ledger technologies like yeah. Well, uh, first of all, um, I want to comment the hybrid ledger and uh, distributed things and blockchain as theme, which has been up for quite a long time. Uh, there have been lots of writings about x being also blockchain-based, but that is not true. And we have been correcting it almost for one year, but repeatedly someone is continuing to publish it. Actually, even we did a joke, we did a 1st of April prank by putting a story about a giant blockchain that we have developed which weighs 5,000 kilograms. And one of the first leading <laughs> blockchain festivals was retweeting it in five minutes. So <laughs> But yes, um, that's <laughs> one separate thing that I wouldn't like to go deeper, but if we talk about e-delivery and what, what is happening within e-delivery, um, I see that e-delivery is more its like a framework. It's like a set of principles giving recommendations, giving some architecture what you have to implement, but it gives lots of freedom for each country to implement the national access points and things. So what we want to do with X-Road is to provide a solution, and we currently are, have been working on proof of concept, of X-Road um, e-delivery adapter service so that we could set up a national adapter service which would act as an access point between e-delivery and uh, X-Road domains. So we have had it already working, so we have tested that the message is moving in the pipeline, but we have lots of legal and administrational questions to be solved about the identities of the organizations exchanging data. So technically it is not very challenging actually, but when it comes to the way how we want to organize it legally and organizationally, that means we have to have lots of discussion. Oh. And we have had many good workshops now uh, with the e-delivery team of the European Union and we continue to do so. So we have more and more technical dialogue. And the purpose is that we could come out with the pilot during this year on implementing such gateway solution for X-Road and e-delivery. Patrick, yeah, one, one big difference I see between Estonia that I spend quite a lot of time with uh, regarding specifically information and Sweden is that in Estonia the government decided like uh, many many years ago that they should run a concept that they called the proactive government regarding, regarding data. This is something that we, just, we, we are just so behind in Sweden. Hmm. In Estonia they decided, what, what is proactive government? In Estonia they decided that just because public sector is so wide, we need to make life easier for the citizens of Estonia and others that interact with the, with, with the public sector in Estonia. Whenever some data is known to some portion of the Estonian public sector, then that data should never have to be entered again. Okay? Because to be able to make the society more, more efficient, data will be collect collected. So if you are born or, or you get a child or whatever, you should never ever have to enter that data again. How many times have you told private sector, the public sector in Sweden, your personal number or security number or how many kids you have or what do you, like, oh, whenever okay. you do mm. that, that is an error in the Estonian system. Mm. What they are talking about is not, is instead, given that data is collected, how should we ensure technically and legally that the data can only be used for whatever intention it is collected, including the sharing? Mm. So when thinking about sharing things between entities in Estonia and between Estonia and Finland, you need to think about it in that, con in that context. So uh, I was uh, meeting with the president of Estonia uh, uh, a month ago, and she got the question together with journalists, and the, and the president got the question, but what, what about your medical journal? Is it much safer to have it on paper? Mm -hmm. And the president, notice, not the civil servant, the president of Estonia said, are you completely mad? Having the medical journal on paper makes it possible for anyone to read it. Now when we have it digitized, you can get notified 
whenever someone opens your medical journal and you can be told who it was, mm. so you can report it back. So that is one of their important mm. control mechanisms. Mm. So, so they have a very explicit goal that in Sweden we're discussing, oh, should we collect the data? In Estonia they said, data is collected. Mm -hmm. Let's make sure cool. we use it as efficient as possible. The mindset is completely mm. different. Yeah. We will have time for, for more questions, uh, but since we're running out of time, uh, because we have the room actually, we, there's nothing else happening, so we can stay on and more questions. But just to conclude on the session, because the time is up, so that those of you who need to leave can leave, uh, I would like you three to just give a, a concluding comment. Will we see more convergence on efficiency and security in the, in the infrastructure uh, ahead as uh, applications and services grow <laughs> and uh, threats, of course, as well? Public. Will we um, see convergence? On the infrastructure which I work, yes, we will see some convergence, but it, the, the difference between different citizens in Sweden will continue. There are certain citizens where I, in Sweden where I would absolutely never, ever try to do any IT-related business. Yeah, yeah I, I think um, it will take time. There is a huge competence issue around uh -huh. here. So, so, so it's, it's sort of... The not invented here syndrome is, is, is also very, very prominent oh, in the Swedish okay. context. So but, but there is a total lack of understanding of the, of the complexity of, of, of lock-in, I would say, mm, okay. that inhibits uh, development but in the right it, direction. But, but posit slightly positive. Yeah. It will yeah. take time, but yes. Yes. Yes, yes, it will take time, but yes. And Ville, what do you say? Will we converge towards more efficiency and stability and security? Yeah, well, um, I try to summarize my thoughts on, on all we have been discussing. I had lots of thoughts going on, but well, to summarize something, what I have been hearing today and before, I feel that in Sweden it's uh, lots of discussion and lots of reports being made now and, and before. Uh, and also very big projects on investigating different opportunities. But what I would like to see is a small step proof of concept things like piloting. In example, there has been discussion on X-Road over 15 years maybe. And, and what should happen is that someone just sets up the environment and gives it a try. Mm. You will see if it works or not. Ah. That's, that's my thing. And it would help many things in the interoperability and data exchange when you take small steps and try to implement something. And I thank you for the summarizing the situation in Estonia. It was really true. Yeah. Uh, legislation is one area. And when we talk about x in Estonia, it's good to remember that Finland uh, implemented it much later, which results in a smaller number of information systems included because we have like two to three thousand legacy systems like Sweden does. So that is the reason for Exron being very different in Estonia and in Finland, but it's mostly legal challenges if you allow the use of data or not. According to the EU, the ones on the only principles and so on, we should be doing it. We should be really enabling ones only principle everywhere, but practically it doesn't go like that yet. Maybe so one day. According to my notes, uh, I've now replaced, uh, so interoperability in metaphors, I've replaced the playground metaphor for the kitchen metaphor. So we are now, the, the conclusion is that we should focus on the layers of the lasagna that we are good at and to be more specific about uh, the procurement, namely what kind of lasagna we want to make. Uh, and then to make a really good bechamel sauce. Uh, those are three uh, co conclusions on, on how we can actually build Secure, qualitative, effect and efficient uh, public IT infrastructure in the future, if I read you correctly. Thank you very much, Patrick Felsberg. Thank you. Jan Lundell and Willa Silvia for attending. And if you uh, have more questions, please feel free to, to ask them now, though, that we have, if there's any more. Yes, we have one here. No, it's just a question on, on um, uh, organization and, and, and business design of developing X-Probes. So because I think we have fairly bad uh, experiences on developing big systems in Sweden. But how did you do it? And, and what is the main reason why you're is succeeding? If you are, uh, is everything going right? Uh, or is it becoming yeah. very expensive all of a sudden? Well, uh, in the history of the development, in the beginning, x used to be a closed system. It was developed only for the Estonian state information system already. And when Finland joined the cooperation in 2014-15, Finland did a request that it has to be open sourced in order to get Finland on board. And I would say that making x open source was the best decision ever made on that software, and it changed the situation radically. And we got much more input from the developer community, requests from the actual users, 
And in example now, XROAD has REST JSON support, which it didn't have in the times when Sweden last time evaluated it. It was still SOAP XML messaging that time. Mm -hmm. So it has changed a lot as a product. It's different XROAD we talk about now and what we did talk about uh, before. So the development model, uh, open source development, that all has helped. And of course, it's more effective development when we have two countries sharing all the costs. Uh, the organization, the institute, which sounds something very big, it's really small. It's four people working in the institute, no more. And then we have development teams working on the actual XROAD code, um, nine people in total this year. It can be much less in the future. Um, they work in the city of Tampere, Finland, because it was a Finnish company winning the public procurement on that development. And it's actually the same team continuing, which was implementing XROAD nationally in Finland at that time. So, yeah. Our chief technology officer is also from Finland now, so it has changed a little bit from the times Estonia put it all together in the earlier years. Finland joined and now this is how it looks currently, but never know who is the next developer when we do the public procurement again. Not Microsoft, maybe, but... <laughs> Magnus? Yes. Um, a little bit curious about the ownership of the information in Crossroad. Uh, I mean, is it... Uh, uh, is that taken into consideration that me, as the topic of this information, can uh, allow or disallow people to access it? Or is it just a, a logging function that can be reported back? Yeah, this was a good point, actually. I wanted to comment it also before when you mentioned about the Estonian model. Because Estonia implemented XROAD from scratch and they had to connect the different information systems. Uh, the coverage of XROAD as technology is so wide that we can say that over 99% of information systems are included. And it enables uh, to have this My Data Tracking tool, which is showing you who has access to your data. It's based on the idea that when you have the same uh, data exchange layer for all of your public administration, then you can record all of that data and to check who has access to your data. But the problem with Finland, Sweden, many other countries is that when we have different legacy systems, which in the end are never going to be connected with XROAD probably, uh, we cannot build such universal tool for tracking all this uh, my data access as we can do in, in Estonia. So that is the difference of the countries and how it's implemented. But yes, XROAD has a kind of add-on part which is for that purpose and it is implemented in Estonia. But, but one thing to remember for Estonia is that, for example, if it is the case that, uh, sorry, the protection, protection against each attribute that you have, that you have stored and given to, to the services, you as an agency, you do not get access to any random data. You only get access to the attributes that you really have used for in your services. So to be able to get access to the data, you need to, to, for example, the number of kids that you have, you as an agency need to actually have as a task to, to, to de do, deal with something that actually have to do with the number of kids of citizens. Otherwise, you don't, you don't get the access. So the, the authentication authorization to the data is really, really fine-grained. And that is because a part of XROAD as well, so yeah. the access to the data is controlled within the environment. So joining the XROAD environment technically does not grant any access yeah. to any data yet. So it has to always be agreed between the data exchange parties. Mm -hmm. And legal agreements yeah. are always needed, except in some cases where Estonia, they have legislation which allows public administration to share data. But still, even in Estonia, I think they have some restrictions on that. Exactly. I must just comment uh, that uh, when you mentioned the, the Estonia example again, and also the tax agency of Sweden, yeah. uh, those stories to me uh, reflect on, a, on an issue which ties on to the procurement. And that's what I meant by never forget what kind of lasagna you're making, yeah. uh, that you actually, there's a huge need to educate procurers, uh, procurement officers to, to actually stay focused on the public use or public value of the system created. Uh, so that you actually deliver that. Uh, and, and it's so easy, uh, even for me as a moderator of this session, to get lost in the, in the, um, in the layers and the pipes and, and, the, and the sauce. To some um, degree, I disagree with you, because this is not the procurer. The procurer is just doing a job that sure. he got as, as a task from someone higher up the organization. The need I'm, owner. I'm really yeah. talking about the head of the organization, which is ultimately responsible, for example, yes. the tax authorities. They have an instruction from the government saying, <laughs> you must collect taxes according to the current tax laws. Mm. And 
they just have to do that and they cannot delegate in that to the procurement is like of course that said within that context of course it's up to the procurement people to do the right thing mm -hmm. including of course thinking about longevity of this of the overall service but yes. no but I'm, what i'm saying yeah. is basically procurement yeah. is in my my world the whole layer of the, Absolutely, the purchasing but side i'm a little bit sensitive because one thing of that course. we heard mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. is that in sweden we're very good at delegating responsibility mm -hmm. and for me that's a no-no yeah, yeah. It's it, the, the reason why we make mistakes in Sweden is that responsibility is delegated. If we talk about security, for example, and functionality, it's like, as I said, notice that I talked with a journalist. We wanted to talk with someone in Estonia <coughs> about this was Utbildningsradion. There might yeah. be some programs about this actually in January TV program. So we wanted to talk with the, the person that is responsible in Estonia for what we are talking about today. And what do the journalists get? Get time with the president. Okay, if it is the case you call the government of Sweden and would like to discuss this topic, you might get referred to a public servant at an agency. Yes. When, would, when do you think the prime minister of Sweden will have a session with a random journalist from a random country? And that's what I, my, the point was that yeah. I thought you meant you, you described stories of need ownership that was yes. not delegated. Yeah. So exactly. the, the head of tax agency uh, uh, maintained the, the need ownership. Bingo. But on the other hand, I think that the, the technical guys providing the suppliers actually were able to, to, to talk to the need owner yeah. and make him, in this case, or her, uh, realize what could be done so that he could uh, frame the, the, the need in the right way. So that you. dialogue, I think, yes. is, is perhaps also a takeaway uh, to say that you guys need to be uh, really up there speaking with those guys and they need to be listening so that need ownership and suppliers can yep. uh, connect. Yeah. Yeah. And, and this thing about procurement, I mean, we shouldn't think about procurer because the, what, what we find in our research is that people point to each other and, and there is sort of a blame going on between different mm. individuals in an organization. So it's a collective knowledge. I mean, yeah. there needs to be disseminated within the organization, the, the, this sure. knowledge, yeah. e even if the responsibility ultimately, of course, is at the top. Yeah. But it, must, it must be honest yeah. also to say that our institutions that are should delivering knowledge can't really teach our young no. people to do this. We are that is also that consulting Absolutely. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. But I think what they make the self dependent yeah. upon sort of consultant instead of mm -hmm. taking their own responsibility b because they don't get the support. It's a natural reaction when you have the, the stories about the transport agency and the, the digital healthcare that when, th when scandals uh, uh, occur, you get you, you don't tend to get bold more bold in how you make decisions and get out there you t tend to put on more you know security uh, and and um, yeah. and be more safe in your decisions and yeah. then delegate perhaps so so how if, if we want to be more bold uh, and but, but it's interesting the discussion with 1177 yes it's a great mistake but if we see so much mistakes that is done every day hmm. because of of the quality and the security. Yes. It, it, it's, it's really, sorry, I want to correct that it's a small mistake with great consequences. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. And who wanted, who, who waved here? No. Yeah, I could yes. just add that. Um, yeah. It's uh, also a question about the country and the way how the administration is organized. As there was an example of Estonia being very agile and how their president even is very active and everything works yep. in a very agile manner. That is really great. But if we look in the way how Sweden or Finland is organized in many things, we can see that it's much slower to get some change. And luckily it's getting better all the time how I look into it, both in Sweden and in Finland. Lots of things are happening in the right direction. But still, uh, what Estonia did very well is that they were able to change their legislation as needed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, when you mentioned healthcare in Finland, in example, we have had a restriction of data classification mm -hmm. so that it is not allowed to use to transfer certain data classes over public internet and because X-Road is also utilizing public internet it's causing a restriction to transfer health data over X-Road in Finland and I go to speak in different e-health conferences and everyone is saying that you have a great tool in Finland which we would like to also implement in healthcare how did you do it in Finland and I have to say sorry but <laughs> we are not able to do it yet <laughs> so I hope it's coming soon and we mm -hmm. get forward with the legislation and, and the data classifications but uh, that kind of issues are very important also in mm -hmm. Sweden when, when anything is to be changed in the national infrastructure. 
and now we are well over time, but uh, you've got your money's worth uh, for, for, uh, for extra info here. Thank you again, Ville Sevier, Björn Dundell and Patrick Felström, and thank you for coming.